Coming up, the Phoenix Suns unveil a new jersey dedicated to the 22 tribes in Arizona. See how the NBA players like their new look. Thousands are on their way to Washington, D.C. for a dedication ceremony of the National Native American Veterans Memorial. We'll get the details. And the first tribal political appointee in FEMA's history joins the show to talk about her new role. I am Malia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach, and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Amidawa Hopa, thank you for joining us. We start our newscast in Washington, D.C., where crowds of indigenous advocates and supporters rallied behind protecting a hallmark law. On Wednesday, the U.S. Supreme Court heard oral arguments in the case Brookeen v. Holland. The case has the potential to overturn the Indian Child Welfare Act that is nicknamed ICWA. It became law in 1978. ICWA has been labeled the gold standard in child welfare policy. It aims to keep Native American and Alaska Native children with Native families in cases where they have to be removed from their homes. That could all change with the High Court's decision in this case. One person in attendance explained why she showed up in support of ICWA. I work um, in the front lines with our children. I'm an ICW worker. So every day, you know, we face the trials and tribulations that they're facing. Um, you know, there, there's trauma, there's um, a lot of um, feelings that the children have that they are trying to um, deal with and on a daily basis. And I, I'm there with them. I feel those feelings. Experts around the country, Native and non-Native, have come out in support of ICWA. The Supreme Court's nine justices will decide over the next few months how to rule. Now to South Dakota, where officials have released new information about a recent excavation at an Indian boarding school. A team at Red Cloud Indian School says they have found no human remains following a survey of the soil. Years ago, a worker at Red Cloud reported seeing three small graves. That's what prompted the search. In a statement on the investigation, Red Cloud says it discovered building products related to mortar for laying bricks and rodents burrowing in the soil when a previous ground penetrating radar went off. A final report of the survey will be posted once one last examination is done of the soil samples on the site. A seven month review of Red, the Red Cloud School by ICT and Reveal found evidence of at least one unmarked grave and at least 20 student deaths. For the first time in Arizona history, seven indigenous women will be sitting on the bench. They will be serving different roles throughout the justice system, working as judges and justices of the peace. Diane Humetua is a U.S. district judge, and Charlene Jackson has been appointed as a superior court judge. Deborah Begay and Susie Nelson are both justice of the peace judges, and the other three judges include Sarah Mae Williams, Victoria Steele, and Jennifer Germain. Many of these new judges were previously politicians. That includes current Arizona State Senator Jennifer Germain. She told ICT that becoming a justice of the peace for a court in Chandler means she will be able to help victims. All of these judges are taking these positions at a time when data shows that Native people are extremely underrepresented in the judicial system. 
In New York, a two-time former president has been elected to serve another term. Ricky Armstrong Sr. was elected as Seneca Nation president last week. He clinched that win after receiving more than 1,100 votes. During his previous two terms, Armstrong oversaw the nation's opening of its first two gaming operations and also led the nation through the beginning months of the pandemic. The Seneca were once the largest of six Native American nations in western New York, and the, pre and the present Seneca Nation consists of over 8,000 citizens. Armstrong will officially be sworn in for his two-year term next week. We end with international indigenous news after a fish tied to the native people in Brazil's Amazon rainforest is making a comeback. Not so long ago, the Pirarachu nearly vanished as illegal and unsustainable fishing swept the lakes with large nets. It can weigh up to 450 pounds and is by far the largest of 2,300 known fish species in the Amazon. And now the fish has come back, thanks in part to the sustainable fishing practices by river communities like the Denny Nation. One of the Denny chiefs talked about the ways they were able to help bring back the massive fish. So this is an activity it's a year-round activity due to the monitoring part. It's an activity that requires a very fine-tuned infrastructure to be able to do everything right. We don't use gasoline in the boats, we use an alternative gas instead, so there's no risk of contaminating the fish. Here, the money brought in from fishing will go to buy a solar panel system and to pay community members to help with catching the fish. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. The Phoenix Suns are unveiling a jersey today that honors the 22 tribal nations of Arizona. ICT's Patty Tholahongva and Max Montour got an exclusive look when the players saw the jerseys for the first time. Check it out. Oh, they're pretty. They're very pretty. One by one, the Phoenix Suns players held up the turquoise jersey and the bonus, a beaded Suns medallion. Stephen Lewis, the governor from the Gila River Indian community, spoke to the team and promptly nicknamed the jersey. Uh, the city edition, I would call it the tribal edition, right, or the res edition, that is very special. This season, each NBA team is unveiling a jersey that's unique to the city where they play. This city edition jersey can also divert from the team's official colors. Suns management, led by Sean Martinez, the senior director of live presentation, spent more than two years consulting with the Intertribal Council of Arizona, Nike's N7 program, and more native groups in Phoenix to come up with the design. Governor Lewis gave them a little history at the unveiling. This land, even here, underneath uh, the beautiful Footprint Center, all of Phoenix was our traditional land. Martinez explained the significance of turquoise, saying it offers protection. Along the sides of the uniform is the word sun in all 22 languages. Governor Lewis thanked the Suns organization for working with tribal leaders on this unique jersey. I really appreciate the Phoenix Suns going above and beyond. And they wanted to do this right. And, you know, instead of doing it without any tribal input, you know, they, they came to, to the, the experts who are the tribes themselves. I think the design catches your eye enough that you're gonna be like, what, what's the meaning behind that? And I think it'll drum up some noise on that end. After the presentation, the players suited up in their new jerseys for a promotional photo and video shoot with some special guests. 22 youth representing each tribe stood in awe as the players walked towards them. I'm re representing uh, Hopi. When I was getting ready, it felt good to get back. Uh, into the traditional clothes again. Uh, when the players came out, uh, I kind of got nervous. I was happy to see them. It was a bit like herding cats to get this group ready for the photo shoot. <laughs> my title is where I represent the little kids in my tribe. I get to meet the basketball players. And every time I met, every time I took pictures with them, I felt so tiny beside them because they're taller than me. I had one girl sitting next to me during the photo shoot and she was talking the whole time, giggling, um, even during serious pictures. I'm like, you gotta stop giggling. But she was showing me her shoes, her moccasins. She was showing me her buckskin bag with the bells on it. 
um, and she had on two bracelets and maybe three rings, all of them turquoise for protection, like the jersey. We talked about um, why am I wearing this and what's um, and what's this called and why am I wearing a camp dress and what's what mostly what my outfit called and why am I wearing it. She said her favorite part was her bag, it was her mom's. The little tie-in loop was an elk tooth, and she said that's her lucky charm, so that was pretty cool. It was both exciting and emotional, says Martinez. The kids, as we were taking the picture, I could feel the energy of the 22 youth that were standing there, and I almost started crying, but I held it in. I talked to Troy Cray. I was asking him about his season and how he's going to improve this year. Then I took pictures with DeAndre Ayton, Devin Booker, um, Toy Craig, Cameron Payne. The feeling I felt was like super exciting because usually I'm just like in the stands watching the games, but like I actually got to like be on the court and experience it. it was awesome. I talked to Payne, Cam, Booker, and AD. And what did they say to you? Did they? Uh, oh, I also talked to the coach. Um, he was saying that he had, he was asking what sports I play, where I'm from, how is it like there. The youth also offered lessons on how to say the word son in their language. Apache language, and the way how I'm saying it is Jana'ai. That's the way how you say um, son in Apache. We say son in Hopi. Um, like Dawa. And it's on the court too. Yeah. Okay. And then it's on their jerseys too on the side. Center court is decked out with a medicine wheel design and a turquoise accent surrounds the baskets. I don't think the native presence here is, is talked about enough, looked at enough, helped enough. So I think that's, uh, I think this is a good place for us to start right now. Playing the champs on ESPN, this is intentional because ESPN is going to have to tell the whole country why are the Suns wearing turquoise and what does it mean? So all of the United States is going to find out in one game like why we're doing this. The whole country will not only see the new uniforms, they'll learn about the tribes in Arizona. The players will also wear the uniform seven times on the road. We intentionally targeted markets that have large indigenous populations like Oklahoma City, Minneapolis, Toronto, all their games are on TSN so all of Canada can get a chance to see this gorgeous uniform and uh, really make sure that we're showing up across the country for indigenous communities. And they'll wear the uniform 10 times at home games as they honor the tribes throughout the season. The celebration, Originative, is being hosted by Gila River Resorts and Casino and kicks off during Native American Heritage Month. It's unbelievable. It's something that I could never dream. Growing up in Fort Defiance on the Navajo Reservation, saying, wow, I'm with the Suns and they're wearing a Native American jersey. Um, I hope it shows that we, we see them and we care about them and we want to honor them and we want to give them hope. We want to give them uh, motivation and you know whatever else we can for them to achieve their goals. In Phoenix, Patty Tholohungva, ICT News. In October, following the release of FEMA's first-ever National Tribal Strategy, the agency announced that Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma citizen Kelby Kennedy will serve as the first-ever FEMA National Tribal Affairs Advocate. She joins us today to talk about her new position and vision for the, for the role. Welcome to the show, Kelby. Halito, yokuke for having me I'm on the show. I'm really excited to be here with you today, Aaliyah. So Kelby, you're approaching your first 30 days on the job. So tell us some about, tell us a little bit about your new roles and responsibilities. 
Absolutely. So as the first ever political, tribal affairs political appointee in the history of FEMA and in the history of the Department of Homeland Security, it has been a busy time. Uh, my second, no, it was my third week on the job. Uh, the National Advisory Council for FEMA actually held its first ever meeting in Indian country. And we went to my home um, in Choctaw Nation back on our reservation. And in fact, the head of the National Advisory Council is now a tribal citizen uh, from my nation as well. So it's been really wonderful to not only attend that important advisory council meeting, but I actually went up a day early to meet with tribal nations to talk with them about issues they were having with FEMA as it relates to disaster declarations. And I just wanna make sure that I have that open line of communication with tribal leadership. It is my job to be an advocate for Indian country. And that can only happen if I have clear communication with tribal leaders and the issues that they're facing within the agency that I now work. And in those early uh, conversations with tribal leaders, what were some of the issues that they talked to you about? So tribal nations have talked about, even before I, I began my job here at FEMA, about the lack of resources that tribal nations have received. States and local governments have gotten lots of funding from Congress for emergency management, um, resiliency. So tribal nations really lack the resources that states and local governments have gotten for several years. So first and foremost, getting resources to tribal nations, making sure the agency policies make sense for Indian country, that they're not just copy and paste state policies. We really need to meet tribal nations where they are. Um, and in particular, in the area of disaster declarations, as you know, um, disasters happen all over our country. Tribal nations are oftentimes the first and many times the only responders to disasters that happen in Indian country. So tribal nations, honestly, at the end of the day, just want to make sure that they have the resources and support that they need to make sure that everybody inside Indian country, whether they're native or non-native, can be protected and supported inside of their tribal lands. We've heard so often from the Biden administration that um, the administration will react to science-based approaches. And science tells us that with climate change, we'll see more and more natural disasters, which of course cause this devastation that you're talking about. So maybe talk about how much climate change is a part of your work in working with tribal nations and you know helping people to um, react to disasters that happen. Absolutely. So FEMA Administrator Deanne Criswell has made it her priority to focus Indian country and also to prioritize climate change in FEMA's approach to helping people across the country. So we know, right, for example, as you just said, uh, there are more and more disasters. And what does that mean for making our country resilient? Again, I think that comes back to making sure that tribal nations have the support that they need, whether that be funding from Congress, um, whether that be, you know, hiring up enough staff internally to FEMA to help with that technical assistance, and making sure that our policies internal to FEMA meet the needs of tribal nations. So when a disaster strikes Indian country, how easy is it for that tribal nation to be able to get a disaster declaration, you know, and get that federal funding to their community as soon as possible to meet their needs on the ground? Let's talk about some goals for this position. Um, you know, as you look forward, what are some things that you really want to achieve and accomplish? Thank you. Um, I think that really comes back to this fantastic first ever FEMA National Tribal Affairs Strategy, which FEMA unveiled, I believe, in August. My goals for this position is to be that advocate for Indian country, make sure that we are getting ahead of the, you know, ahead of the curve and making sure that we are being proactive and coming to tribal leaders and talking to them about the issues they're experiencing and seeing what policies and flexibilities the agency has internally to be able to make sure that they can, again, access those disaster resources access the variety of programs that FEMA has available that maybe they haven't been able to access before. So really my biggest goal is to hear from tribal leaders, hear what their priorities are, and then at the same time make sure that I'm doing my job as a tribal citizen inside this administration and catching things coming down the pipeline that could impact Indian country or things at my, you know, at my previous job, I used to work for the National Congress of American Indians, things that tribal leaders passed resolutions on, telling FEMA for years um, that they wanna see certain things move and change within the agency and see if there's a way to coordinate and make sure internally that we start moving in a way that reaches those goals that tribal leaders have told us for years that they want us to accomplish. Kelby, you already started touching upon this already, but I, I would love to hear how your work at NCAI informs the way that you'll approach this role. Absolutely. So I had the honor of working at NCAI for over four and a half years. My job really fit into two buckets. It was Homeland Security and Emergency Management. And then the other side of my work was Violence Against Native Women 
and Department of Justice and Criminal Justice. So I had a really great chance to work on the Violence Against Women Act earlier this year. And then in turn for my emergency management role, I got to have a lot of those great building relationships, both with tribal leaders and tribal emergency managers at NCAI to grow my knowledge base. My knowledge when I came to NCAI about emergency management was, was you know, from the perspective of a tribal citizen who grew up on my res and we had a tornado hit uh, the day I graduated high school. And it was my tribe that came out and actually helped people in my community recover from that tornado. So I was coming from it from the tribal citizen who is in a small, poor community and my tribal nation really stepping up and helping out in that internal situation. So it, it shaped me in that I got those relationships, but I also knew that you know tribal leaders have a really hard job. They have 50 different or even 100 different roles that they have to play for their communities and making sure that you know, in times of crisis, when they need to access federal resources or federal programs to make sure that their people are safe, that we have already done the work on our job at FEMA to make it as easy as possible for them to get the help that they need when they need it most. Well, Kelby, thank you so much for your time today. Chipisulachki, yakoke. On Friday, the National Museum of the American Indian will hold a three-day dedication event for the National Native American Veterans Memorial. Tribes from across the country will be a part of the Native Veterans Dedication Ceremony at the National Mall. Here to tell us more about this historic first is Rebecca Troutman. She's the project coordinator for the memorial. Hi, uh, Rebecca. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So start us off by telling us at a high level about this memorial and its importance. Sure, so this memorial is intended to uh, honor the long and really extraordinary history of Native people serving in the United States Armed Forces. Native people have served at a high rate in, in the, uh, the, the country's military ever since the Revolutionary War and continue to do so in very high numbers. But most of the country really isn't aware of this, this long history of service. So the intention for the memorial is to both to honor the service and to offer an opportunity to raise awareness and educate the public. And I understand that this memorial is uh, a first of its kind, but tell our viewers exactly how that is. Yes, so this is the first memorial on the National Mall to specifically honor Native American veterans. It's unlike every other memorial on the Mall in that it's not specific to one era or one conflict or to one branch of service. Instead, it honors all American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian veterans who've served in this country's military um, again from the Revolutionary War going forward into the future, every branch of service, men and women. Rebecca, as we get closer to this event, maybe tell us where some of these veterans groups are coming from for this dedication ceremony. Sure, you know, we uh, we have veterans groups coming from all across the country and we're really excited to welcome so many veterans here to, to, the, uh, to the National Mall. We have over 1,700 veterans registered to, to uh, participate in a procession of Native veterans on the National Mall. We've been hearing from uh, communities who are sending honor flights or buses or caravans of veterans. We're just so looking forward to welcoming so many people here to the memorial. And uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the programming? I, I saw a quick look at the agenda and it looks like it's a jam packed uh, weekend. It is. So uh, Friday afternoon, beginning at two o'clock Eastern, we'll have the procession of Native veterans on the mall. This will lead directly into the dedication ceremony, which will begin at 4 p.m. Eastern on Friday. Uh, it will go for about an hour and a half. Uh, and on Saturday and Sunday, we'll have a whole series of musical performances. We'll have films playing in our theater. Uh, I'll be giving a talk on Friday, on Saturday afternoon with the designer of the memorial, Harvey Pratt, uh, discussing his approach to the memorial. And so uh, the events on Friday and many of the programs over the weekend will be live streamed on the museum's website, which is AmericanIndian.si.edu. I'm so glad that you brought up Harvey Pratt. Tell our viewers who he is and uh, maybe a little bit about how he was chosen um, for this project. 
Sure. So Harvey Pratt, uh, in addition to being a renowned artist with work in many collections, he's a member of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma. He's a Southern Cheyenne peace chief. He's also a, a Marine Corps Vietnam veteran. So he really brought so much of his own experience to his design. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that both his, his experience growing up in a Native community and understanding how veterans are honored and respected in his community, and also his own experience as a veteran, understanding what veterans and families really need from this memorial. And uh, maybe describe the memorial a little bit for us, for the people who, of course, can't be there in person. Sure. So the memorial is on the grounds of the museum outside. It's set into the landscape surrounding the museum, and it's set in kind of a wooded area overlooking the wetlands. There's a winding path that leads you towards the memorial. The centerpiece of the memorial is a stainless steel vertical circle that sits on a low stone drum, drum form. There's water that flows across the surface of the drum. There's a circular seating area where people can gather, you know, sit and reflect, remember those who have served or remember their own service. It's meant to be a space of welcome and of reflection and of healing. And we should know that ICT is sending some journalists to this dedication ceremony and we'll have more for our viewers uh, next week. But in the meantime, Rebecca, thank you for telling us about the dedication of the National Native American Veterans Memorial. Thank you so much for having me. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.